The zeal of thy house shall consume me. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may be seated. Have you ever had a favorite restaurant that you love to go to? And then all of a sudden, uh, you went back to it a few years later, and you realized it wasn't what it used to be. It's under new management, or they changed the architecture, and the kitchen just isn't what the kitchen used to be when they moved the pizza oven or whatnot. We, we don't know how many times Jesus has visited the temple in Jerusalem. Uh, what we do know is that at one point, he had been there when he was about 13 years old for his bar mitzvah. And that's what God, the, the gospel of Luke tells us. Jesus went there with his parents. And then when his parents can't find him, they said, don't you know that I need to be about my father's business? He's in his father's house. All of a sudden, in the gospel of John, we find Jesus once again at the temple. He's gone to his favorite restaurant, and it looks like it's under new management. Looks like things have changed. Looks like things aren't how he, had, how he remembered them. And that's a bit about what we find here. Now, you may have wondered, if you're from a more liturgical background, well, why did we not process the gospel? What you might not have noticed is during Lent, at the, what we've done here at, at St. Peter the Fisherman is we're not bringing the gospel out to you because Lent is considered a penitential season. So the point is we're trying to just show you uh, that no gesture is wasted in our tradition. So the fact that the gospel doesn't go out is not that Jesus isn't calling you, he's not among you. It's, it's showing there's a, there's a distance between us and God. That was the whole point of the temple. There's a distance between God and humanity. And the purpose of the temple was to bring people closer to God and God closer to the people. That was the whole purpose of the temple. The purpose of restaurants is to feed people. The purpose of the temple was to bring people closer to God. But what happens? Jesus goes in, and, and, and I love it. If you look at verse 13, it's not in, in our reading because we didn't start there, but it says, after this, Jesus went to Jerusalem. Well, what's the after this? Well, the after this is he was just at a party. He was just at the wedding of Cana. And now we see the ultimate party crasher, if you will. He had an amazing party. He's the party provider. And now he's the ultimate party pooper, if you will. So there's four things that happen in this text. One, we see that there's a, a pilgrim's progress. Uh, secondly, you see there's some priestly prophets being made. And then there's a prophetic purge. And then... There is a precious payment. See, lots of peas, but hopefully it will stick in your head, okay? So there's our four points. A pilgrim's progress. What do I mean by that? So in the Old Testament, it set out that the people of God were supposed to make a pilgrimage. They were supposed to go to Jerusalem for the Passover. So uh, in conservative archaeological estimates, they say that first century Jerusalem might have had 80,000 inhabitants. But then all of a sudden, during Passover... Uh, that number exploded, similar to like Bike Week in Daytona. Wait, does that resonate at all? Uh, I was just driving down uh, Speedway yesterday, and it was, it was busy. So you got to realize it was busy. Not only did it go from about 80,000, conservative estimates say about 300,000 people. Some would say up to a million. I, we, we don't know because there, there were temporary structures, so they wouldn't have built houses for people while they were there. If they were pilgrims, they would have had tents or whatnot. But even if you went for the, the lowest guesstimate, 300,000 people, not counting the sheep, the goats, and the animals, and everything else, living or dead, that was about to be sacrificed there. So we're talking about a lot of human beings and a lot of non-human beings there. And the, the point is, is that these pilgrims came from all around the diaspora, all around Israel. So it, in 587 B.C., the, the first temple is destroyed by the Assyrians and then the Babylonians, and, and the Jews are exiled. And then they rebuild this. This is the second temple built by Herod, and you see that Herod's been on a construction project. It doesn't, didn't take four weeks like our bathrooms, but 46 years, and they're still not done. Um, so this whole temple was a place where people would stream to, and people have been exiled for about 500 years, but they would come, whether it's from Libya or the, from Carthage or from Galatia or from the far-flung flung provinces of the Roman Empire. And the thing is, um, have you ever done a road trip with your favorite pet on I-4 or maybe on I-95 or something like that? After 12 hours, it gets a bit busy, right? 
But imagine taking your favorite pet for three months. Or maybe not your favorite pet, but your favorite sacrificial animal. <laughs> so the whole point is that to make it easier for the worshipers, uh, they, they, because the whole point of the temple was to make it easier for people to access God and God to access them, um, the authorities of the temple said, look, it's hard to travel with your animals. We'll provide the animals when you come here. So you can buy your goat, you can buy your sheep, you can buy your turtle dove. We'll provide all that for you. Which makes sense. It's a good thing. It's not a bad thing. The whole system was, was meant to get people closer to God and God closer to the people. Secondly, um, when they traveled, they would be coming with all the different currencies that they had. You might have your drachmas or you might have um, your talents or you might have all your different din your denarii. But the point is, is that we just read the Ten Commandments, didn't we? What was the second commandment? You shall make no graven images. Well, almost every coin in the Roman Empire at that time had an inscription or an imprint of the Roman emperor who was considered semi-divine. So imagine taking something semi-divine, an idol like that, into the courtyard or, or the the, the temple premises. You couldn't do that. No graven images. So you're trying to do the right thing. You're trying to observe the Ten Commandments, the Second Commandment. So you can't let money come in there. So what are you going to do? The right way to worship God is you're going to provide people to, um, to exchange that. I'll take your denarii and I'll exchange that for either a, a Jewish coin or a Tyrian coin. Those were the two coins that, that Josephus tells us were in use in that, in that temple because they had no divine images on them. And so they, they weren't bad practices. So there's a, pilgrim, a pilgrim's progress. But the second thing that we see is that there's a priestly prophet to be made. The whole point of this system of worship was to get God's people close to him and God close to them. But Ezekiel tells us this. He says this about the priests, about the pastors, because they're using this, this term about shepherds in the book of Ezekiel. He says, God says to Ezekiel, he says, you shepherds are supposed to be feeding the sheep. Instead of feeding the sheep, you're feeding off of the sheep. You're actually eating the sheep rather than feeding them. And what they would do is they would say, well, you need a dove. Well, a little markup because, you know, we've got to maintain this church building. We're in a construction project. You know, here's a 10% tax. Or you would exchange your money. Ever traveled and try to change your dollars into euros? Did you ever get a one-for-one -one exchange rate? The market rate? And the market keeps fluctuating because people have to make the money, right? The whole point is like, what started out is like, we want to just, it's just the fair price, right? The fair price. They decided they could make a little bit of profit on the side. So that's what's happening here. And Jesus walks, he's like, this is not how I remember it. I'm supposed to be at my father's business. This is a house. The, the word in Hebrew says, Beit HaMikdash. It's the house, it's the holy house. You've turned my dad's house into a marketplace. It's crazy. It doesn't even feel like church anymore. It feels like a big old marketplace is what he says. So Jesus, it tells us, fashions a cord, um, uh, a whip from cords, and he drives, he overturns the tables, and he drives out the animals. Now, interestingly enough, if you've read Matthew, Mark, or Luke, they actually have the cleansing of the temple, right? Right after the triumphal entry. So wouldn't this be better suited to put into Palm Sunday? Well, uh, as Bishop N.T. Wright, who uh, teaches at Wycliffe Hall in Oxford, um, says actually there's a, it's better understood that there were actually two temple cleansings. Not that John is being ahistorical, but here's the thing. Look at the dialogue of, the, of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, what Jesus says there, versus the dialogue that Jesus has here. Two separate dialogues. Even the instrument that he uses to drive out the money changers in Matthew, Mark, and Luke is one. The instrument that he uses here is a completely different instrument. A scourge versus the whip that's reported in the other one. The dialogue is different. The timing of it is different. In fact, uh, when you look at John chapter 11, Jesus says, let us go again to Judea and celebrate the Passover. In fact, you see that in the Gospel of John, um, you read Mark and Mark, you know, kind of happens it feels like Mark happens, if you read it cover to cover, like Mark chapter 1 and Mark chapter 16. You can do that in 45 minutes if you actually sat down and read it. But it feels like it happens in about a week. But when you read the Gospel of John, you read that there's the Passover in chapter 2. Then he does a few miracles, a few I am sayings. 
Then there's the Passover that happens again in chapter 6. There's the Feast of Tabernacles in chapter 7. And then you get the Passover again in chapter 12. That's three whole years that transpires in this whole Gospel of John. You get the, the sense of three years of ministry that you don't necessarily get in the other Gospels. So it makes sense that, that Jesus is doing a prophetic purge. And here's the thing. If Jesus was just a backwater prophet, um, why was it that, that people had to go out and find out who he was in Matthew, Mark, and Luke? If he was just a rabbi up in Galilee, he wouldn't have been that famous. But what if a rabbi in Galilee went down to Jerusalem and gave those priests a run for their money? So it kind of makes sense that there would have been two temple cleansings. But anyways, there's, there's this prophetic purge that he's doing. He's like, this is supposed to be a house, and it's, you've turned it into a complete marketplace. Some of y'all might be Methodist, right? My middle name is Wesley. But interestingly enough, Wesley was actually an Anglican priest, so I'll throw that one out there for y'all. But here's what he noticed. He noticed when, when the whole, his whole Methodist revival was starting in the Anglican church that the average priest was getting paid about 30 pounds a year. The bishops were getting paid about 5,000 pounds, which actually in today's day and age adds up to about $2 million dollars. If you did it. So you can see what priests were getting paid, what the bishops were making. That whole priestly, pro, pro, prophet, that, that priestly prophet, if you will. So Wesley was absolutely incensed about, not about that. The whole point is that this is about worshiping God, not about making money. That's not what church is supposed to be about. Church is, about, is supposed to be about worshiping Jesus. Jesus makes that scourge and and. You know, Jesus, meek and mild, we love that, you know. It's, you know, a little town of Bethlehem, and that's why we love Christmas so much. But you don't get Easter, and you don't crucify people that are meek and mild. You ever thought about that? Like, you really don't. Nice people, you invite them over for dinner. You don't nail them to a cross. But there's something about Jesus that challenges the status quo. There's something about Jesus that he wants to even challenge us about our own complacency. You see, when, when the Reformation started with, with Martin Luther, and then you had Cranmer who helped start the Anglican church, the church in England, um, the church of England. The church has been in England since like the, two, the second or third century, but the church of England. Um, they noticed that, that there were these abuses that were happening in the church where people were selling sacraments, like, I've had people ask me, can I baptize my kid here and I'll pay you for that? I said, like, no, we don't charge for that. You want your kids baptized? We'll do that. We don't sell sacraments here. In fact, that's forbidden in church law, in canon law. You don't sell sacraments. And so Jesus is saying grace is something that's free. We don't charge for that because it's free because it costs me everything. And why is Jesus' prophetic purge something that challenges us? It challenges us because... Man, it means that if he's driving out money changers, what is he driving out of my life? What is he driving out of your life? And sometimes during Lent, you know, we cut out a little bit of sugar or we cut out a little bit of coffee or a little bit of cake. Jesus is saying, I don't want you to just cut out some coffee out of your life. I want to be that surgeon that cuts out that cancer that's eating at you. That thing that you have no idea is actually bad for you. Something you thought was good for you needs to go. And then my father's house will become a house of prayer for all nations. Well, that's the dialogue of the second temple cleansing. The first temple cleansing just says, you've turned into a marketplace, dudes. But the fourth thing is, how does Jesus do this? He does it because it's a precious payment. You see, there's a, a variety of different images that we get for what happens on the cross with Jesus. We get this courtroom picture, one of, you know, Jesus who justifies us as this just judge judge in our stead. We sometimes get the idea of a, of a battlefield, the Christus Victor, Jesus, this conquering hero against sin and death. And then sometimes we, we get the picture of this example, greater love has no one than this than that one lay down his life for his friend. But this instance, we get a picture of what's called redemption. What do I mean by redemption? So I, I remember I, I, I parked my car um, in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania on a on a blizzard evacuation route. And uh, some of y'all from Florida wouldn't even know what that is. But anyway, I didn't know what it was because I'm from North Carolina. But I, I parked my car and I 
I, I, I flew out to visit my, my parents because I, I went to school up north. Went to visit my parents, came back from Christmas, and my car was gone. And then I went down to the local pound, and I had to get my car back. And as I paid my, at that point it was $200. I'm not sure what you'd pay nowadays for that. This was 24 years ago. I, I redeemed my car. And they stamped on my receipt, redeemed. I paid the price, and they gave me my car back. It was mine. Jesus says, you've turned my father's house into a marketplace. Jesus redeems us. That's the word that's used in Greek. Redemption means to buy back from slavery. I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. When you walk through the fire, I will be with you. When you go through the waters, you shall not be drowned. Why? Because I've gone into those fires, I've gone into those waters, and I've paid the price that you couldn't pay. In the words of that famous Archbishop of Canterbury, Anselm, he put it this way. He said, why the God-man? Why do we need the God-man, Jesus? Well, it has to be man because man committed the sin, the offense. So man has to pay the penalty. But why God? Well, it has to be God because only God can fully pay the penalty. And that's in his beautiful treatise called Cur Deus Homo. Why the God-man? Jesus is the perfect, precious payment. Not only for our sins, but for the sins of the whole world. The perfect satisfaction and oblation once offered for all, to use the words of right one. Jesus pays the price to set us free. And because of that, you don't come to just an altar anymore. That was old covenant. That's the old priestly system where priests mediated things to you and you were distant from God and and the gospel didn't come out to you and, and there was all these barriers built up. Jesus tears the veil of the temple and unites us once again to God. Dick Lucas, the rector of St. Helens Bishopgate in London, put it this way. He's since retired, but he he says, I want you to picture this. Picture a a discussion, if you will, between a first century Christian and a first century Roman neighbor. Ah, the neighbor says, I hear you're religious. Great religion. Love that. Uh, Where's your temple? Where's your holy place? We don't have a temple, says the Christian. Jesus is our temple. But no temple? But, but, but surely we're your priests who do all their rituals. We don't have priests to mediate the presence of God, replies the Christian. Jesus is our high priest. No priests? But where do you offer your bloody sacrifices? He's British, so maybe he didn't say bloody. He probably said sacrifices, right? Where do you offer your sacrifices? To acquire favor from your gods. We don't need a sacrifice, replies the Christian. Jesus is our perfect sacrifice. What kind of religion is this? It ain't a religion. It's a relationship with my Father. Father, we thank you that Jesus is the ultimate pilgrim who went the furthest distance left his throne in heaven to come to us. We thank you that Jesus cleanses us from all unrighteousness and that he made the perfect payment for our sins and not just for our sins but for the sins of the whole world. This is a true and trustworthy saying. So Lord, we ask that you would remind us of that as we come to this table, that we come as your sons and as your daughters, and you welcome us to sit and eat with you. Amen.